we are going to discuss a different kind of data type which requires the understanding of the concept of a pointer. This is not a natural concept in modern programming and in fact even object oriented programming languages like Java and all do not provide for an explicit pointer type of data handling. However, C++ which emerges out of the traditional C uses the notion of pointers extensively. In fact, as we shall see later in the lecture, invoking functions by passing on parameters by reference requires us to understand and use pointers. Curiously, the string variables which we have used so far in the class, they are just like a float or a double or an integer, we would define a variable called string and assign any string value to it. We never bothered so far about how a large or small string could be accommodated in a single variable. We have never put an upper bound on the number of characters in a string that we insert in a string variable. Whereas we have upper bounds on integers, floating point numbers, double, etc., etc. It is important for us to understand the notion of capacity of storage, the notion of addresses of storage elements, and that is what we shall look at in this lecture. So effectively, what we are going to discuss is the representation of data objects inside a computer. So when now we talk about a computer, we are talking about the real machine. We shall have another lecture later to describe the notion of hardware and system software. But today, we are just going to look at how the data is actually represented inside the machine. So essentially, we will look at bits, bytes, and memory locations. Specifically, look at the data type called CAR. This is not a type we have introduced so far at all. So this is a new data type as far as we are concerned. We shall look at how the CAR type of data is handled, how character strings are handled using CAR type of data, and what are essentially pointers, which are essentially uh, uh, references to the addresses of the locations which contain values. We will specifically look at parameter passing by value, parameter passing by reference, and a function call where we use the pointers rather than the values. So this is how the actual data is represented. The machine comprising of electronic components specializes in using devices which can exist in one of the two states only, like a switch which can be either on or off. There is no intermediate position typically. So similarly, the digital electronics permits you to have devices which are called transistors in a state of zero or in a state of one. Zero and one are notional. They are actually represented by physical variables such as voltage levels. So certain voltage and below that could be zero, certain voltage and above that could be one or vice versa. In fact, in the modern electronic circuits, the entire game is played through electronic circuits which can combine the so-called logical levels of zero and one or high voltage and low voltage through AND gates, OR gates, NAND gates, etc., etc., to provide for variety of combinations that you can make out of the zeros and ones. A more complex circuit would result in a circuit for adding two binary numbers, subtracting binary numbers. In fact, addition and subtraction is hardly distinguished because computers used what is known as the ones complement and twos complement notion for representing negative numbers. We will not go into those details right now. Suffice it to say that any data within the machine is actually represented using only two symbols, 0 and 1. There is no third symbol. So naturally, if you wish to represent larger values, such as decimal numbers, for example, we need more binary digits or bits. BIT bit stands for binary digit. This is a short form for binary digit. For example, if I want to represent number 4, 
it could be reprinted by 100. Number 5 could be reprinted by 101. You are all familiar with binary representation of numbers? Not a very enthusiastic yes. So you have not studied binary representation. A binary representation is very much like a decimal representation where the base is 2 and not 10. So worthwhile to quickly look at that. Here is a representation of decimal number string. Because you have 10 symbols, 0 to 9, you write them in the unit position. You have exhausted the symbols. So if you want to write the next value, which we verbally call 10, the 10 will have to be represented by going to the next position, writing 1 there and writing a 0 here again, which is the first symbol. After that, the next number 11 is written as 1, 1, then 1, 2 and so on. So basically, you in keep incrementing this position until you exhaust the symbols. Then you increment the next position by 1 and again start incrementing the uh, unit position and so on. This is the decimal system. If you had an octal system, an octal system will have only 8 digits. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. These are the 7 symbols in an octal digit. An octal meaning base 8 system. A base 8 system does not recognize any symbol beyond 7. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's it. So there 8, 9, etc. do not exist in an octal system. So obviously the next value that you want to write here, which is 8 as we conventionally call it, will be written as 1, 0. Then when you go on 1, 1, 1, 2, etc., etc., at 1, 7, you will again exhaust these symbols. So the next value will be written as 2, 0. So just as a decimal system is represented, suppose you have two digits, you would call it D1 into 10 to the power 0 plus D2 into 10 to the power 1 plus so on. This is the decimal system. The octal system on the other hand will be written as D1 into 8 to the power 0 plus d2 into 8 to the power 1 plus so on. So look at this 1, 0. 1, 0 will mean 1 into 8 to the power 1 plus 0 into 8 to the power 0. So 1, 0 is actually 8. 1, 1 is actually 9. 2, 0 is 16. 1, 7 is actually 15 in octal system. So this is where you represent numbers in different systems. Suppose you had an hexadecimal system where the digits are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. How many symbols? 16 symbols. Because you have the base as 16. So you can write a number wherein again the representation will be D1 into 16 raised to 0 sorry, D, uh, plus D2 into 16 raised to 1 plus 1. So what will be the decimal value of a number A8, A8 hexadecimal? What is the decimal value of this number? It is 8 into 16 raised to 0, which is 8, plus a into 16 raised to 1. A is how much? Numerically decimal value is 10. Because this represents 9, A represents 10, B represents 11, C represents 12, etc. Et so A actually represents 10. 10 into the power 16 is how much? 10. So this is equal to 168. So that is how you would represent different numbers in different number systems. Coming back to binary number system, it is much simpler because you have only two symbols, 0, 1. Now you want to write the next number which is numerically as we understand is, is value 2. We have no symbol left. So what do we do? Like we did in the decimal system, if you see here, what did we do? We went up to 9. When we exhausted the symbols, we wrote 1 here and wrote 0 here. Exactly that is what you will do here. So this is binary representation of 2. You 
carry on with this. One zero. Next number is one one. But after that, there is no other symbol. So this becomes zero. After that, there is no other symbol. This becomes zero, and then you write one here. So that is how the binary number system. You can easily work out what will be the different values and so on. What I have tried to do here in this slide is to just show exactly some sample value. So this is zero 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 is zero 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 one is one zero one zero is two zero one one is three and so on. Naturally, the largest number that you can represent using three binary bits is seven because all one one one. Smallest number is zero, largest number is seven. The total number of numbers that you can represent with three bits is two to the power three. Just as total number of numbers that you can represent with three decimal digits is ten to the power three. Thousand numbers, zero to nine nine nine. Similarly, here zero 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 to one one. The next number naturally you have to write as one zero 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 and so on. It should be very obvious that when my numbers become large, the number of bits that I will need will be larger and larger and larger. Typically, eight such bits are grouped together to form what is known as a byte. In fact, the common unit of measurement. of memory capacity of a computer is always a byte this is the smallest unit in which you measure the computer's memory nobody measures it in bits but bits are gr grouped together and there is a historical reason why a group of 8 bits is called a byte and why not a group of 6 bits or why not a group of 48 bits or why not a group of 137 bits any number could have been chosen people chose 8 bits to represent a byte for a reason we shall see that reason later so the computer the machine actually has a memory comprising of a large number of bytes each of the bytes has a unique address just like our homes in a colony but homes are larger smaller but each home has a unique address in computer memory a byte is a home all homes are exactly identical each home can contain 8 bits and each home has a unique number a unique identifier that unique identifier is called the address of that byte most machines are byte addressable for certain representations it is not conducive to use a single byte it should be obvious that some of the values that we deal with cannot be represented in a byte for example suppose i want to use some numerical values I want to reprint 1,258. Can I reprint it in the 8-bit byte? No. 8-bit byte, the largest number in an 8-bit byte is 0 to 255. Not sufficient. So what I do? I extend the binary representation and take a 2-byte representation or a 4-byte representation or a 8-byte representation. We had roughly touched upon this topic when we discussed. the maximum values represented by our integer float and double and long kind of types there at that time we had roughly calculated the number of decimal digits that can be held in integer values and the number of digits of precision that you can have in floating point and double digit but we looked at it from a decimal angle actually what happens internally is the entire arithmetic is binary or some form of binary octal or hexadecimal hexadecimal is more pop popular because when you consider exponents instead of considering them as power of 2 considering them power of 16 permits you to have very large exponents the same bits will represent a much larger value if the base is 16 however the precision depends entirely upon the number of bits that you have for mantissa or the number of digits that you have in an integer or long will again depend upon the number of bits that you have for the precision long and short of the story is that 8 bits are never sufficient to represent meaningful numerical values and therefore computers group multiple of bytes together and these bytes could be say 2 or 4 bytes can be used to represent integers 4 or 8 bytes can be used to represent floating point numbers so consider this int m n float a 3 this is an array this array has of three elements a0 a1 a2 now consider how the memory is allocated in dumbo's drawers we had seen this model earlier there will be a drawer which will contain let's say value 573 it will be tagged as m 
this drawer is tagged as n three consecutive drawers will be tagged as a0 a1 a2 these are the memory locations and these are the values now if the address of m notice that what m is can the value 573 be stored in one byte answer is no in fact when we say integer m depending upon the implementation of c++ compiler the memory allocated will be either 2 bytes or 4 bytes similarly depending upon the implementation of float float will generally be 4 bytes assume that the computer representation that we are talking about for our c++ compiler uses 4 bytes for integers and 4 bytes for floating point now as i said i have here m n a0 a1 a2 let us write down in terms of the memory map in terms of bytes how exactly will this look like let us say this is 10000 byte and this is where the value of m begins as you know m is defined as integer that means it will require 4 bytes so the value of m will occupy four consecutive bytes and these four bytes are to be considered as if there is a sequence of 0 0 1 0 etc etc 1 0 1 1 whatever 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 all of this considered to be a single binary number is the value of m but the m itself begins its existence from byte number 10000 which i have arbitrarily chosen to be some address of a byte however the next variable n does not begin at 10001 it will begin at 10004 i am deliberately using these numbers as decimal numbers so it is as if we have one byte houses in a colony each house has a unique number but by definition certain values will take more than one house to live an integer will take four consecutive houses a float will take another four consecutive houses a double will take eight consecutive houses now whether m is allocated memory immediately before n or somewhere else it does not matter but all four bytes of m must have consecutive houses because the bits must be interpreted consecutively usually in c++ when you declare memory almost all the variables that you have declared in the order in which you have declared they get allocated memory so consequently you will have m allocated here n allocated next four bytes and this will be 4 5 6 the next is array a the a0 element please remember the array a is float each element requires four bytes so a0 itself will begin 10008 and so on is this notion clear of memory allocation now inside my c++ program whenever i say m equal to something what the c++ compiler does is it calculates that something in the binary format naturally and puts that something into these four locations when i say m is equal to p plus q it does the same thing with how does it know where to keep this value m is after all a symbol that i have used the c++ compiler when it is looking at your program the process of compilation comprises of the following memory allocation and freezing memory locations in computers memory where the listed variables of your program will finally reside so consequently it is c++ which assigns the memory locations actually it says i require four locations for m four for n four for a0 if there is double eight for double etc etc and these are the addresses of those memory locations so consequently the address of m is 10000 but address of n is not 10001 but 
How, what does this depend upon, this displacement? This depends upon size of the variable. So if the variable is integer or double or float, the size could vary. As I said, the size could depend upon the compiler. Integer, for example, could be implemented in 2 bytes or 4 bytes. How will you know? If at all you have to find out, as we shall see later, you might have to find out. There is a special function available in C++. If you just say, size of M, the size of M looks at the type of M and returns the number of bytes that M will occupy in the computer's memory. So it will return 2 or 4 or 8 or 20, whatever be the size. So it is a useful function. Why are we going through all these details here? We are going through all these details because ordinarily we refer to these contents of memory locations by the nice names that we choose for them. M, N, A0, A1, etc. However, there are occasions when we may want to refer to these contents by the actual addresses. And why would we like to do that? Why would we like the actual addresses to be handled? After all, what do we bother about as long as M and N mean whatever we refer to? Let me skip to another slide which is much later and motivate you to understand why these are required. Consider parameter passing to functions. So let me give you the same example here. Imagine I have written a function like this, integer function sum, int a, int b. I don't have to do any computation here because I want to add them and find it out. It's a obviously artificial function. I don't need a function to add to the numbers. I could do that directly by a simple arithmetic expression. But this is just to illustrate the point. So if this was the function, I can simply say return a plus b. This will mean that the value that is returned by this function call, which is an integer value, will be the value of a plus b. In the main program, what I do is I write int m, n, and s. I read in the value of m and n. I invoke this function sum m, comma n. And the resultant value which the function will return, I am assigning it to s, which I print out. This is a normal way of invoking function. Now observe what is happening here. When I say sum m comma n, the value of m is transferred to the corresponding variable integer a here. The value of n is transferred to the corresponding value of b here. And these values which have been transferred are added to get one single value return. So that is how I get back s. This is called passing parameters by value. So the parameter value is located and that value is passed. That is the reason why instead of m or n, I can write a constant value or I can write an expression which will be evaluated. Its value will be copied there. This is as if I have a variable m which starts here, 1, 2, 3, 4 bytes and a variable n which starts here, 1, 2, 3, 4 bytes, and then I have this s which starts here, something like this. This is my memory allocation for the main program. Imagine as if in the function I have a similar allocation for a and b. So effectively what is happening is this value of m is actually transferred to the value of a. This value of n is transferred to the value of b. And the computations happen on these two values. And the return value which is returned by this statement is returned back into this expression. So when I say s is equal to sum m comma n, m comma n goes there into a and b, a and b is added and the return value becomes the value of this entire expression by the way. 
this whole expression is replaced by the return value which is then gets assigned to s and so on this is called value passing by value please note that this works perfectly all right when i have functions which have to return only one result value whether it is sum of two numbers or sum of an array of 1000 numbers or an average of 1000 numbers as long as a single value is to be returned a single string a single number this function call is perfectly fine but what if i have to calculate two values and return them <coughs> or three values and return them or 1000 values and return them this mechanism is not good enough that is what i have tried to explain <coughs> in this slide what do we do if we need to get back more than one value upon return more importantly how do arrays get passed to a function come back with modified values you remember that i had in one of the slides given you an example of a function which reads a large amount of data into an array and returns the number of students for whom the data has been read technically the single value which was returned was the number of students that is a single integer value and that is the return value of that function so all of us assume that is perfectly fine because a single value was being returned what all of us forgot to ask is that look the same function was reading data from input and pushing it into various elements of the array and we presume somehow that when we come back to the main program all the array elements will continue to contain the values which the function has read strictly speaking in passing by values no such thing can be imagined anything that happens inside the function on variables that i have passed on from here there is no reflection back arrays is an exception because arrays are always passed through a pointer or reference and not by value we need to understand what me what it means by passing a re reference rather than a value effectively let's go back to this example here if this is my mechanism where the value of m is copied into a and then this function operates upon it there is no mechanism for me to get back the changed value from here consider for example instead of returning these values i wanted to swap these values what is the value in m i want to put it in n what are the values in n i want to put it in m i can write a main program to do that by using a temporary variable i can put i can initiate temp to equal to m then say m is equal to n n is equal to temp the two values will get swapped but suppose i wrote a function where you send me two values and i will return back swap values i can't do it because i can't return two values however if i say that instead of passing the parameters by value as in this mechanism if i could somehow pass on the address of this m and the address of this n which is called a pointer if somehow i could pass this pointer and indicate to this function that look buddy what you are getting is not an integer variable value but you are getting a pointer then it will tell this function that while i use these parameters i am not supposed to copy the values and use them but rather directly use the pointer and the value pointed out by that point that means effectively there is no separate memory allocation that this function should do for such parameters which are passed as pointers but it says rather use the original position itself in the memory wherever the main function is naturally if then in the process the function modifies any one of these parameters obviously the original values will be modified because there does not exist any copy all operations are done on the original thing itself so this is the advantage of passing by reference where i say i am not passing the value but i am passing a pointer to the reference however i need additional notation how do i represent pointers how do i tell the function that i am not sending a value but i am sending a pointer reference to you these are some of the issues that we need to check which we shall see now so in short the normal memory allocation 
is done in the order of appearance and as I said in actual practice, the addresses would invariably for typical implementation be like this. If the first location has an address 10,000, then the next location for n will have the address 10,004 because m will be allocated four consecutive bytes. n will be allocated four consecutive bytes. a0 will be allocated four consecutive bytes and so on. Notice that all the array elements are always allocated consecutive bytes. So while m and n technically can be anywhere, a0, a1, a2, etc. will never be anywhere. They will always be together. In terms of data representation, so we just notice the following. Pointers are nothing but such addresses. What should be the maximum value of address, minimum value of address? After all, that will depend upon the type of computer you have. Some computers have very large memory and therefore they have the address space. It is almost like saying how big is the housing colony. If the housing colony has only 1000 houses, three digit address should be sufficient, 00099. But if the colony has 10,000 houses, I will require four digit address. If the colony has million houses, I will require so many digits. So depending upon the size of the colony, the address, number of digits in the address will vary. If I say that address is my pointer, then I will have to worry about the value in the pointer. However, a C++ compiler takes care of that. Whenever it compiles, it allocates sufficient memory for the pointer so that the address within the scheme of the machine that it is dealing with, that addressing space is sufficient. So we don't have to worry about it. Consequently, we shall see how we can refer to this pointer without ever bothering to know its actual value. After all, if my program is compiled after somebody else's program, the starting address could be 20,000. Tomorrow I recompile it, the starting address could be 5,000. It is not as if the computer's memory is perpetually reserved for me. Any program which is executing will occupy memory as we shall see later on. Memory is dynamically allocated. So the base address of the starting address could always change. What is important is once the base address is fixed, base address plus 4 is this, that plus 4 is this, that plus 4 is this. And therefore we leave it to C++ compiler as to what is the actual value of such addresses. Suffice it to say, all that we want is ability to refer to an address value as a pointer and pass on that pointer to some function or some part of the code in my program. So that I can refer to a value via the pointer rather than referring to it by M or N alone. That continues to be feasible. This value is always represented by M or N or A0, but it is additionally represented by an address which we shall call the pointer. In the same way, let me describe that there are two useful data types which are supported by C++. Each occupies one byte. One is called bool, which stands for boolean, and the other is called char, which is different from string. Char is a variable which contains a single byte, one byte only. The type bool is used to represent the truth value of our comparison. So logical comparison, remember, which results into true or false. Now this true or false can be kept as a value of a different data type called the Boolean data type or bool. So if I describe, if I define bool answer 1, answer 2. And then I have, let's say, int x equal to 25, some arbitrary initialization. Suppose I say answer 1 equal to true. Please note that answer 1 or answer 2, once it is defined of the type bool, then it can have only one of the two values, true or false. The plain words, T-R-U-E-F-A-L-S-E. -E. These are not arbitrary words of your choice. These are reserved keywords of C, uh, C++. So they mean true or false in the comparison sense. So true is the value assigned for this. I can assign a value answer to equal to x less than 25. Ordinarily such an assignment would not make sense because x less than 25 is a question which we will ask in the if statement or while statement. But apparently a question can be asked as a part of the expression. C++ evaluates that expression to a value true or false. In this particular case, x is equal to 25. So obviously, x less than 25 will result in false. 
Consequently, answer two will become false. Answer one is forcibly assigned a value to. At any point in time in my program, I say if answer one something something, while answer two something something. So wherever a Boolean value is expected to arise in a condition checking, I can use a Boolean variable with either a pre-assigned value or recomputed value. In short, a Boolean value is a natural and acceptable result of any expression evaluation. It will be zero, uh, it will be true or false. And this is represented by zero or non-zero values that we shall see later. The character that you see on your terminal or keyboard again has a unique representation. It is represented by an internal code. Typically, you use ASCII codes. These ASCII codes are available on internet on most of the textbooks, as I said. Kuhun's book at the end, the first appendix gives you ASCII codes, which are 8-bit codes for all numbers. Represented in decimal, the 8-bit codes are for typical letters are this. Small a has a code value of 97. Small z has a code value of 122. You can conclude that small b will have a code value of 98, small c will have a code value of 99, etc. Because b is greater than a, c is greater than b, and so on. And z is greater than y. So a to z, all values are numerically aligned. Similarly, capital A to capital Z is in the range 65 to 90. You remember the new line character that you write, which you write as backslash n. That has a value representation of 10. A blank space is represented by 32. These are numerical values. Notice that all these values are between 0 to 255 because ASCII code is less than 8-bit. So an 8-bit byte is sufficient to store a character. Now one can declare variables in a program of the type char. For example, you can say char later 1. Just like you say int y or float x. You can say char letter 1, char letter 2. Note, however, that this is not a string. Please note when you define a string, the assignment use a string within double apostrophe. A char variable always has a single character as a value and it is always written in single apostrophe, single quotation mark. So letter 2 equal to y is a correct representation. Letter 2 equal to double quote y double quote is not correct. But that is a string. That is not a character value. Of course, there are some rules by which some conversions will happen automatically. So please note that the strings that we used were a different kind of items altogether. They were not variables really. They are objects. They are instances of an object class called string. But in terms of the variables like integer, float or whatever, what we have are the characters. Now, using these characters, can we make strings? The answer is yes. And traditionally, C, C++ strings have been made out of such things only. So far, we have used the type string. For example, we say string student name, and we say student name is equal to, let's say, Rajesh Mashruwala. You all remember this kind of assignment? This is a string in the C++ string object sense. So actually, string represents a class of objects and not just a simple data type. There is nothing like a simple data type in string, of string in C and therefore in classical C++. Only when you have a natural data type that you can define operators on it. Notice that when we said string is a class, we define concatenation of string by saying str1 plus str2 and so on. In natural way in which things have been represented in C, or the traditional way is to use a char array. That means you use an array of 60, 70, 100, 200, 2000 elements in which you stuff consecutive characters of a string and say, ah, that is my string. This is an artificial representation. And there is an additional artificiality. When you put such characters in an array of characters, char then to indicate that my string has ended, because a name, for example, Rajesh Mashruwala has 17 uh, characters including this blank. Deepak Fatak will have different numbers. Some other name will have different character. How do you indicate that a string has ended? So in the artificial mechanism, a string would be ended by pushing a backslash zero value in the location immediately after the last character. So suppose Rajesh Mashruwala has 17 characters 
actual positions occupied in that array will be 18 positions and the last position will contain a backslash zero. This is completely artificial. This is not how any common sense string representation will happen, but this is how C programming did C string representation and this is how the C++ continues to represent strings. So apart from the object class string about which we shall see later, there is a basic way of representing character string and in this semester, in this lab, you shall be using character strings to handle some of the data. So character strings as in character arrays. Here are some additional aspects about this. Suppose char s name 60. Please note as I said this can hold 59 characters of a string only because an additional character is required to hold backslash 0. Backslash 0 is called null and therefore these strings are called null terminated strings. They are special representations in C, C++. In short, you def define a character array, just like int array or float array, you define char array. Char s name 60 means effectively I am going to use this s name array to store a string which may contain at most 59 characters, s0 to s58, s59 which is the 60th element will contain backslash 0. In case the array has less than 58 character, 59 characters, then I will put the backslash 0 immediately after the last character. That means I will know if I start looking at this array right from the beginning, the moment I see backslash 0, I know my string has terminated there. Although the array might have more number of elements left. So, we cannot now say S name equal to Rajesh Mashruwala. Please understand this. This is illegal because S name is not string. S name is an array. An array cannot be defined a single value like that. Each element has to be assigned a different value. So each location has to be assigned a value. For example, S name 0 is R, S name 1 is E, etc. S name 17 is backslash 0 because Rajesh Mashruwala has 16 characters. Such strings are called null terminated strings. Highly artificial representation, however, extremely concise representation, a fairly clever representation and a large number of ready-made functions to operate upon such representation is what is available. However, please note that C++ does not bother about array overflow. So if you have an index, let's say S name i, now if i becomes 500 and your array is declared as S name 60, tough luck, something else gets stood up in your program. So that is your responsibility as usual. But since a string stored in this fashion is not a predefined data type, normal operations cannot be performed. Even for normal operations, I will have to write programs. Consider this program which will find the length of string stored in S name. Please note that we could find the length of the string in a string type of object by putting that object dot something as a function reference to that object. But in this case, we will have to write functions in the conventional sense. Here is the way you will calculate length. Start with length equal to 0. Assume that S name has the necessary value for i equal to 0 to S name not equal to backslash 0. Keep modifying i plus plus. Please notice that you are not doing any action here. You are merely looking at each and every character stored in the S name array. S name 0, S name 1, S name 2, S name 3. You don't want to bother about what that character is. You have to find out, you have to count the number of characters up to backslash 0. So the for condition terminates when this you find the backslash 0 and you'll come out of it. When you come out, whatever is the value of i is the length of the string. Because the last element will contain backslash 0. In decimal number, that will be the length of the string because the actual occupation starts from 0th element. Please note, however, that suppose there is no valid string in that array and there is no backslash zero, then this will become an infinite loop going over the entire memory of the computer again and again and again because there is no other way to stop this. So please understand the responsibility that you need to follow when you use such things. I have listed in these slides important functions from C string library. So if you just say hash include C string, all these functions will get included. Some of the functions are string copy. For example, if you say s1, s2, s2 is copied into s1. 
you can say s1 equal to s2 by the way in object class string you could say s1 string 1 equal to string 2 but when you are s1 and s2 as such artificial arrays you say string copy another copy exists called string n copy where you give a count so that means only those many characters of s2 are copied into s1 there is a string cat or concatenation this is basically saying that s1 is equal to s1 plus s2 and you have string n cat where it is s1 equal to s1 plus first count characters of s2 so this is partial concatenation str length s1 it returns the length of s1 this is exactly the function that we just saw str cmp it lexicographically compares strings s1 and s2 remember in a program we wrote str1 greater than str2 directly that is because such string comparisons on objects could be done because objects know how to handle it but i can't compare two arrays whether one array is greater than another array or not but when i have used this special mechanism to represent strings as null terminated uh, character array then i can use this function which will compare s1 and s2 in lexicographic sense and will return a negative number if s1 is less than s2 it will return a zero if s1 is equal to s2 and positive otherwise so i can actually make string comparison str str is actually searching a string within another string so let's say s1 is abraka dabraka and i am s2 is ra so abraka dabraka i will find two rs there essentially this will return a pointer okay to the first occurrence of the second string in that similarly str chr look searches for a single character instead of uh, the complete array s2 the complete string s2 mem copy copies count characters from s2 into s1 there are, this you can actually go to the c++ help online and find out all of these there are several functions which examine or change a single character these are also extremely important functions for example you are looking at a line of text that you have input consider the compiler itself which is reading your program the program is nothing but a series of alphabets opening bracket closing bracket opening bracket less than comma semicolon all these symbols are going somebody has to make sense out of it you can write programs to make sense out of such text provided you can look at every character and do something meaningful there are a hugely uh, 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 useful functions for looking at such things for example is al num or is alpha this will check you give a character as a, a parameter to it it will check whether that parameter is between a to z capital or small to check whether it is alpha if it is a control character control a control b if it is digit 0 to 9 is it graphical graphical means any printable character is it lower case is it upper case is it a punctuation mark is it a full stop comma exclamation all those are automatically checked e space this does not check for blank space that is silly because blank space can be compared this stands for white space so you know if you have a stream of characters coming in on your cil then you can examine each character and if you check whether e space then it will match with any blank space it will match with any uh, uh, new line character any tab all of these which are known as uh, white spaces this will be matched the innumerable additional functions which you can use meaningfully i leave it to you to uh, uh, to look at these possibilities and uh, uh, do the uh, lab assignment this will be the last assignment today just one uh, uh, announcement we will we we'll skip the location uh, looking at the pointers and the uh, references later i hope you have formed teams of four members already any people who have not formed teams yet can you raise your hands okay you got up to wednesday if you remember correctly to finalize your teams and the team names and the team leader names must be intimated i must have this consolidated list because i am planning a meeting of all team leaders and batch coordinators if you recall batch coordinators are individuals who are chosen by the five team leaders from amongst themselves so each lab batch has five teams each lab batch must have five teams by the way if some lab batch 
has less than five teams because there are fewer students and five students have compiled together, then they must recompile them and break them into three students' teams. But each, each lab must, lab group must have five teams. Make, make sure that you do that. And all the leaders, so each team will have one leader, since there are five teams per lab group and there are 40 lab groups, there will be exactly 200 leaders. I want exactly 200 people in the FC Kohli auditorium on Sunday in case a particular leader of a team is unable to come. The leader may re request any other member of the team to come. But under no circumstances, there should be more than one member from any team because the space there is limited. We shall be discussing on Sunday morning from 10 to 12 briefly the four projects which have to be done. And immediately between 12 to 12.30, the five team leaders of every batch have to get together, there itself on the spot, discuss for five minutes and fill up a form for the priority of the lab that they would like this to be first choice, this to be second choice, this to be third choice, this to be fourth choice. What I guarantee is that every lab batch will get at least one of the four choices. Well, that is trivially true. Uh, okay, we'll meet on Thursday. Thank you.